Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good afternoon, everyone. It is Wednesday, August the 31st, 2022. It is currently 2.02 p.m. Central Time, and I'm coming to you live from the Theology Central Studios, located right here in Abilene, Texas. Now, you know how I like to begin, right? I like to begin by asking questions. So are you ready? I, I, I sometimes hate that I start the same way so frequently, but on the other way, I, that is just, I love to approach things in a questioning way. Like, here is the question. Now let's consider and think about it and see if we can come up with a definitive answer. I just kind of like that approach. Some of you would say, don't, don't start with a question. You always start with a question. I know that, but in this particular case, I need to. So, so, or I guess I could say this. I could not, I could, I could approach this by not asking a question. I could just make a statement. Today, let's talk about ongoing sin. I, I, I could, I could do it that way, but I, I prefer to ask it as a question. If you claim to be a Christian in your mind, How do you understand the presence of ongoing sin in the life of a believer? How do you understand that? Do you believe that it's the norm? That, look, we're Christians, but we we still have a sinful nature, and we're going to sin, 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 and we're going to sin? Or do you think, no, 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 we won't have ongoing sin. I mean, we may struggle here or there, and you try to somehow modify it. Do you just embrace the idea that you're a Christian and you sin every single day? You sin constantly. Do you embrace that? Do you, and when I say embrace it, I'm not saying that you embrace it as, oh, it's a good thing, but you just embrace that it's a reality. Or do you try to modify and go, well, 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 I mean, I mean, we don't sin all the time. Do you try to modify it? Or here's another question. On one hand, do you say, yes. There will be ongoing sin. We're Christians. We sin all the time. However, when someone sins, pastor, deacon, or elder, then everyone's like, well, I can't believe that. Well, if your theology says we are all sinners and we're all going to sin on a regular, consistent basis, then why are we shocked when sin manifests itself in the church? So what? which is it? Do we really believe in ongoing sin? Do we really try to modify what we believe about ongoing sin? What do we really believe? And, and the reason I'm asking this question is earlier today, I came across a YouTube video entitled Ongoing Sin, and I could not resist. I had to, I had to hit play, and I just started hitting, I, I hit play for like 10 seconds, and I'm like, nope, 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 nope. Why would I rob the listeners of the Theology Central podcast an opportunity Well, to hear someone talk to us about ongoing sin, let's listen to it together. So, so I, let me just try to throw this out there and try in summary so that we at least kind of know the questions I'm asking. So what do you think about ongoing sin? What do you believe about it? Do you believe that it's just, that's the, that's the reality. That's the normal for the Christian life. Ongoing sin. It's going to happen. I don't care if you're behind the pulpit, in the pew, in the Sunday school classroom, in the sound booth, in the parking lot. I don't care if you claim to be a Christian, there is ongoing sin in your life. Now, if you, if you do embrace that, then how does that work practically when sin shows up and is manifested in the life of people in your church? Uh, hey, everyone's going to sin. Whoa, but but not that sin. Like like how how do you how do you process that? Okay? Or do you do you somehow try to modify? Well, we're going to sin, however, and you kind of put qualifiers. Well, you won't continue in the same sin. Like you find all of these qualifiers to somehow lessen the reality of ongoing sin. All right. Well, how do you, how do you really handle it? And I could offer some more thoughts there, but I just want you really thinking along those lines. So here we go. I, I, I was going to say more, but I don't want to give it away because I at least heard the first few seconds of this and I know immediately which direction this takes off in. And so I don't want to give it away, but are you ready? All right. This comes to us from YouTube. Ongoing sin. It's only 18 minutes long. 
uh, by Paul Washer, which is obviously very, 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 very well known and very famous. But I don't care how well known or how famous someone is. I'm by obviously I'm under no obligation to agree. So I may disagree, which I know will then probably immediately put me in the minority. But that's okay. That's okay. I want you to think about ongoing sin. I want you to really think what is your theology in regards to ongoing sin and the life of a believer? Because I think we say one thing, we act a different way, <laughs> we make claims. We, I think there is so much contradiction and confusion in regards to believers and ongoing sin. So maybe this will just spark or start a conversation, but I think it's a conversation we need to have because every time something happens and I hear Christians talk, they sure don't seem to think ongoing sin is a reality. They really don't. They may say it is, but man, when someone messes up, (laughs) oh, ongoing sin no longer exists. All right, here we go. Ongoing sin. Let's think about it today on this Wednesday, August the 31st, 2022. Are you ready? Here we go. Now, as always, the volume is lower than I want it to be, but I have it cranked to 100. I I don't understand why so many things are posted online at such a low volume. I I just don't understand. But here we go. So there will be some major fluctuation between me and it. But I, I've done everything I can. I will try to come in quiet <laughs> until I hear something. But I have a feeling we're not going to get very far, and I'm going to be right back in. But here we go. Ongoing sin, Paul Washer. It's like an 18-minute little, it's not even, it's not a sermon. It's just him, I guess, talking about the subject. And, uh, well, you may agree with him and disagree with me, but at least you're going to hear two different perspectives. Here we go. How does a Christian deal with ongoing sin? Well, first of all, we need to understand that if a person is a Christian, their heart has been regenerated. They've been Okay, let's stop right here. I'm going to back this up. Okay, so immediately, it's funny. He starts with this. So how should a Christian deal or think about ongoing sin? And his approach is not to begin with, well, the... Re- We just need to start with the reality of ongoing sin. He doesn't start with the reality of ongoing sin. He starts with a separate reality. Hey, okay, how do we deal with ongoing sin? Okay, well, let's not look to ongoing sin first. Let's look at a different reality. And he's going to start claiming all or start naming all of these things that we supposedly have as believers, All of these realities that we are supposedly have. Now, we're going to listen to him name all of these realities, but I really want you to think about this. This is where I find myself in conflict with much of Christianity. We find ourselves, we claim that, okay, ongoing sin, right? Don't worry about ongoing sin. Remember all that you have as a believer. Here's all of these realities that you have as a believer. But whenever you hear the realities listed, if you were to write them down and any logical person look at it, you would then draw the conclusion, then why is there ongoing sin? In fact, why isn't there sinless perfection? Why isn't sin not the norm but the rare occurrence, because if you listen to the way Christians describe all of the, all the things we have, all of the supposed power and ability that we have as believers, sin should be the most uncommon and unique thing. It should be, it should be the exception, not the rule. So I always find it weird that on one hand, Christians are like, we have this and we have this and we have this and we have this and we can do this and we have this and we can do this and 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 this. And then somewhere after they list all of that, say, however, but we're all going to continue to sin. Why? The two don't make any sense. The two doesn't make any sense. I almost started coughing. The two doesn't make any sense. If I have all of this ability and all this power and I'm set free, I mean, you hear Christians say that we are set free, not only from the penalty of sin, from the power of sin. Well, then why do we sin? Why is it sinless Christians the norm? And when you meet the one who isn't sinless, you look at them and go, what's your problem, man? Man. 
I, I, I never hear good answers. Like we just preach the one thing and ignore the other. And it's like when we want to preach about all of our power, we preach it that way and we ignore the other. And then we want to preach about how sinful everyone is. Then we ignore everything we said about the power. You've got to bring the two concepts together and find some way of reconciling the two. So he's going to start off, hey, you want to talk about ongoing sin? Well, before we talk about ongoing sin, let's talk about all the things we have as a believer, which to me would tell you there shouldn't be ongoing sin. Let, let, let's see how he describes it. How does a Christian deal with ongoing sin? Well, first of all, we need to understand that if a person is a Christian, their heart has been regenerated, they've been made alive, they've been given a new heart, and uh, also the Holy Spirit dwells within them. All right, let's stop right here. So three things right off the bat. We've been regenerated, so we have life. Number two, we have a brand new heart. All right, we have a brand new heart. And three, we have the Holy Spirit in us. Now, typically that is described as empowering us, strengthening us. Now, if you take those three realities, think of 2,000 years of church history. Look at all the sin, 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 broken family, sin, 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 sin. And, and you can sit there all day long and try to pretend that you don't sin, but I'm sorry, you do. Be ye perfect as your heavenly Father is, is perfect. You're not perfect. Be ye holy as he is holy. You're not holy. Have a pure heart. You don't have a pure heart. Love God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul. You don't do that. Love your neighbor as yourself. You don't do that. I can go on and on and on and on and on. You are in a continual, continual state of sin. Now, if you acknowledge that, then explain how you can be in a continual state of sin, yet supposedly these three things are true. You have, you've been regenerated. You now have spiritual life. You now have a brand new heart. Now, I'm assuming that means the old one is gone. Now, is the sinful nature still there? Is the sinful nature still impacting the heart? Or you did, did you just acknowledge the, the eradication of the old nature? I mean, the old heart was deceitful and desperately wicked. So now that I have a new heart, it's not, no longer deceitful and desperately wicked? Oh, and I have the Holy Spirit. So I have the Holy Spirit. And typically that's described as empowering. So if those three things are true then how do you understand ongoing sin? Is it simply a matter of, well, you just don't, you just want to keep sinning. Well, why can't those three things overcome my desire to sin? Shouldn't they be able to eradicate my desire to sin? Shouldn't the Holy Spirit be greater than my desire for sin? Shouldn't a new heart well, give me new desires? All right, let's, I'm going to back this up and let him say that all again. Here we go. How does a Christian deal with ongoing sin? Well, first of all, we need to understand that if a person is a Christian, their heart has been regenerated, they've been made alive, they've been given a new heart, and uh, also the Holy Spirit dwells within them. So a Christian is going to experience changes, transformations. They are going to grow in conformity to Christ. Yet at the same time, we will never be free from sin on this side of heaven. Um, I want us to look at first. Now stop right here. These things are true, yet we're never going to be free of sin on this side of heaven. So we have a life. We have a new heart. We have the spirit, but we're never going to be free of sin. Now, you can just take a piece of paper and just write these things down, all right? The, these are what we have, and here's the reality. We have these things, yet we're never going to be free of sin. Why? How come? I mean, it's just amazing. Christians will literally walk around and say, if you're in Christ, you're a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. We say that, and then yet we say, at the same time, say, but you're going to continue to sin. Well, if I'm continuing to sin, then obviously not everything is new. Now, of course, I believe that I'm a new creature in Christ positionally. Everything is new positionally, not practically, but many teach it in a practical way. I like, how do you not see the contradiction? Hey, we have all of this power. We have all of this change. Yet we're going to continue to sin. What? It, it, okay, let's see if he's going to explain it. 
John in chapter 1. And John says, verse 8, If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. Um, one of the things that is so evident about someone who is a Christian, it's not that they're sinless, but that they recognize sin in their life. And when they see that sin, they confess it. A lot of times we don't see how extraordinary that actually is. We live in a world that is sinning constantly against God. And yet, so few people recognize their sin, take responsibility for their sin, confess their sin, mourn over their sin. So when you... Let's just make sure we, we, we got to modify this. Yeah, the world is out there sinning against God, but so is everyone inside the church. See, I, I always hate that. Well, we live in a world where everyone in the world is constantly sinning against God and those in the church are not constantly sinning against God. Now, I am 100% in agreement that as a believer, we should see our sin, acknowledge our sin, and confess our sin. What I think it, it, that, that as a Christian, we should even be more painfully aware of all of our sin. Now, we, we have a tendency that as long as I'm not, not committing the big ones, I think I'm okay. We should see all of our sin in thought, word, and deed, by what we do, by what we leave undone. I do believe Christianity should make us more sensitive to our sin, more aware of our sin, and definitely should lead us to confess that sin. I am in complete agreement there. I just don't like that. You know, we live in a world where they, all they do is sin against God and everyone in the church sins against God because all sin is against God, right? So we're all constantly sinning in some way, shape, or form. You see a person who has professed faith in Christ doing these types of things, it is evident that they truly have come to know him. You see, a Christian will sin less, but they will not be without sin. But when they do sin, it will cause sorrow in their heart. It will lead them to repentance. Now, see, I, I have a major issue with this, that we're going to sin less. How do you quantify that? What do you mean we're going to sin less? He already acknowledged we're, gonna, we're not going to be sinless, so there's always going to be sin. Well, if there's always going to be sin, how do you then quantify, measure a less sin? I think our sins change. I don't know if the amount changes, the kind changes, right? Like we may be out committing like if you're in the world, these very blatant outward external sins, right? Yeah. And, and someone just said, good question. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. But let, let me make it, let me try to explain what be, before Christianity, right? You're just out doing whatever you want, right? And it's much more external. Once you become a believer, I don't believe you sin less. You just sin differently, your sin may become more internalized because we, we, we dress ourselves up also almost in a robe of self-righteousness, which by definition is a sin. <laughs> okay. We, I think we're more diff, we're, we are more, I hate to use the word deceptive, but we put forth a form of godliness. But all of those, I mean, how can you say you sin less when we understand Phil? Like, look, we, think about it this way. Before Christianity, you may see sin simply as a mere external act. But with Christianity comes the idea and the understanding that sin is not just the external act, it's the internal thought, the inter internal desires. Christianity reveals not that we sin less, but that we sin continually. Sin, Christianity reveals the fact that, that we just sin, we may sin differently as a believer. We not, may not be so bold, so external in it, but it's still there. It's all inside. Now, of course, he already claimed that we got a new heart. So I don't know where all this internal issues arise from because he didn't explain how, how we can have a new heart and just continue to sin. But I just don't, Christians love to say that when you become a Christian, you sin less. 
where, where, where's the mathematical formula that figures this out? Well, before, and this is how it almost always sounds. This is how it almost always goes when Christians talk about this. Well, before I was saved, I was sleeping with prostitutes in Vegas and I was doing drugs and I was in a gang and, and I was this and I was, and it's all these external actions. And now that I'm a believer, well, I don't go sleep with prostitutes anymore and I don't, and I'm not in a gang anymore and I, and I stopped doing drugs. Okay, great. You stop those sins. You're telling me you don't have all kinds of sins still in your life that may be very different than ever considering those sins before you were saved. It's always, we always just reduce it to, I used to commit these external acts. I don't commit those external acts. So therefore I sin less. No, you just stop those sins. But you still have plenty of sins. Uh, many, 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 many. And, and, it's, and, and it's like somehow it's a badge of honor. Okay, so, so, this, so this is how it works. This is, this is the Christian, we're, we're very weird way of thinking. All right, so you get regenerated. So now you have life. Before you were dead, now you have life. Oh, you have a brand new heart. You used to have an old heart, but now you have a new heart. Oh, now you have the power of God living inside of you. And the best we can pull off is some subjective idea that we sin less. We sin less. We're not sinless. We just sin less. But we don't, re- we don't ever quantify it other than saying, I used to do these external actions and now I don't. Who knows what's going on inside? But that's our badge of honor. I, I just, I, I, if we've got a new heart, we should just be, I, I, just, I don't understand the Christian way of thinking on this. Right, let, let's see though if he's going to clarify. And the confession of that sin. He says, if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. There are so many times when I will preach in a church and this very same thing will happen every time. Uh, Maybe I'll preach in a church about sin or about the necessity of being holy. And sometimes the Spirit of God will be working and and many people will be broken over their sin. And what seems to be so unusual is this. The people who are usually the most godly, sincere, and devoted in the church are the ones most broken over their sin. While those who show little signs or evidences of having been born again sit there as though they had no sin at all. And what we're seeing is the working of the Spirit of God in God's people and the lack of that working in people who profess faith in Christ but really do not know Him. Now he says this in verse 9, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When the believer sins, the believer should confess that sin, turn away from it, and ask for forgiveness. Now, what is confession? Confession literally in the Greek is is a word homologeo, and literally it means to speak the same thing. So if I am a Christian and I study the Word of God and reading the Bible one day, the Lord convicts me of sin, Or let's say that a brother in Christ who who dearly loves me sees that I'm not walking as I ought to be and he speaks to me about my sin. And I know it's from God. He's using the scripture. It really is true. I have sinned. When God tells me through the word of God or through the instruction of another believer or some other way, when God tells me that I have sinned, when he speaks to me, you have sinned, Paul. You were impatient. Confession is not just to say, I'm sorry. Confession is to speak the same thing. When God says, Paul, you've been impatient. Confession is when I say, Lord, I agree with you with regard to my sin. You say I've been impatient. You are right. I have been impatient. That's confession. And then asking for forgiveness. Forgive. Now, I think that's a great explanation of confession. Confession is speaking the same thing. I am in agreement, God, that this is a sin. Doesn't really help me with ongoing sin, 
right? I'm just going to be speaking the same thing with God about my sin on a more regular and consistent basis. I think the more you grow as a Christian, the more you realize how messed up you really are. So I'm just going to be agreeing with God a lot about how messed up I am. He doesn't, he hasn't really addressed like, so, so how do we understand ongoing sin? He starts off by making it sound like that based with what we have, we shouldn't really be having ongoing sin, but then he says we will have ongoing sin, but then he says we should sin less, but he hasn't quantified how we even to, to draw the distinction between that. And then he says, but we will confess, meaning speak the same thing with God. Okay, now he's only got a few minutes left. Let's see if he's gonna, gonna really help us understand a theology of ongoing sin. Let's see if we can really, really, really grab onto how we are to think about this. Give me for my impatience. Now, so we see here that even though a believer is going to be transformed and continue transforming, even a believer will experience change and conformity to Christ. Okay, <laughs> a believer will be transformed and transforming. So we're going to be transformed and we're going to be transforming and we're going to be con being conformed to the image of Christ, right? So this is all going on, right? We're, com we're con transformed, we're being transformed, and we're being conformed to the image of Christ. All right. All right. But we're still going to sin. We're still going to, and we're going to sin continually until we are glorified. All right. So I go from transformed to transforming to being conformed, but I'm going to continue sinning. Okay. All right. I'm still trying to, trying to make sure we understand this, exactly how that works in any practical way. Let's see if he's going to, to, to flesh this out. We will still have to deal with sin in our lives. Hopefully, It'll be a lot less as we grow, but it will be there, and we have to deal with it, and we deal with it through brokenness and confession. Now, now he's back down to hopefully it will be less. Hopefully it will be less. That doesn't sound now. It's a guarantee that it will be less. He, he seemed to make it before that it, we will sin less, but now it's just hopefully we will sin less. And again, I just don't know what we have a tendency to do. If I stop doing certain external things, I'm like, see, I'm sinning less. But there could be a million things going on internally. I mean, I, I'm like, how, do, how can I just think about this? Has anyone ever truly loved God with all their heart, mind, and heart, mind, body, and soul, and their neighbor as himself? I say we fall short of that 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So if, I, if there is a sin that I'm committing basically 24 hours a day, seven days a week, then how do I ever quantify that I'm sinning less? Oh, I may have stopped that external act, but guess what? You know what led to that external act is because I don't love God with all my heart, mind, body, and soul, and I don't love my neighbor as myself. So even though I stopped the external act, what caused the external act is still present because I still don't love God supremely and love my neighbor as myself. So even if I stop the external act, I say, I'm sinning less. No, the very thing that led to that sin is still present. <laughs> Like, I, 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 look, I, I am a sinner, not because I sin. I'm a sinner because that's what I am by nature. And the nature is still there. All of the external acts, even if I stop five of them, the sin that led to the external act is still present in me. I'm still a sinner. So I don't understand. I, I sin less. I sin less because I stopped those external acts. And the very thing that led to those external acts is still present in you. You still don't love God the way you're supposed to. You still don't love your neighbor as yourself. You still have pride. You still have bitterness. You still have unforgiveness. You still have all of that. I don't know how we, how do we not real, it's almost like we can't hear. We're so used to speaking the Christian language. We can't hear the, its own inherent logical fallacy at times. recognizing that what God says about us is true and confessing it. Now, let me take you to another text that is very, very important. Very important. Um, in Psalms 119.11, David says, Your word I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. How can we grow in conformity to Christ? How can we sin less? One of the essential essential things we need is here in verse 11, the word of God. Look what he says. Your word I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. Now, 
If you're listening to this, let me ask you a question. How much time do you spend in the Word of God? How much time do you spend reading the Word of God, studying the Word of God, memorizing the Word of God, meditating on the Word of God? Most people, when they hear this question, they kind of bow their head and acknowledge not enough. Some even almost not at all. This is one of the reasons why that we have so little power over sin is because we spend so little time in the Word of God. All right, so let's make, so let's make sure this is a, a typical Christian evangelical way of looking at this. Okay, so let's make sure we, we process this. All right, you become saved. Boom, you're transformed. Boom, you go from death to life. Boom, you now have the power of the Holy Spirit in you. Boom, you have a new heart, all right? So, so and, ma- and many Christians would go on and say, you're set free from the power of sin. So you can do it, right? We, we've, we've done podcast episodes about looking at how you can do it. Oh, but wait, 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 time out. Don't get too excited. You're still gonna sin. You're still gonna be a sinner. Okay, wait, so I can, but I can't. I can, but I can't. Now we're kind of given the, 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 they play the ace card. They play, they play their hand that's going to win their, the game, the card game. All right. They, they've got the ace up the sleeve. Here we go. You ready? They're going to play it. Here we go. It's your fault because you don't study your Bible enough. If you studied your Bible enough, dun, 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 you would have power to stop sinning. Now, I guarantee you it'd be like, well, well, even if you, then I guarantee you, if they would have to modify it at some point, well, even if you studied your Bible 10 hours a day, well, you're still going to sin. Well, wait a minute. I thought you said, if I do, I do agree the Bible, the word of God is there to help me combat sin. I completely agree. It is there to, because look, I may not know something is a sin without the word of God. The word of God tells me it's a sin. The word of God exposes that sin maybe in my own life. I am convicted by it. So yeah, I do believe the word of God has an important part to play in our struggle with sin. But this is just the go-to like, Here's all the things you get at salvation, which you would think would mean I would be sinless. But then we say that doesn't really cut it. You're still going to sin because we can't say you're going to be sinless because we all know there's sin. But nobody sees the inherent contradiction there because we just speak Christianese without ever thinking of the logical fallacy of what we're saying. So then we have to figure out, well, if we have all of these things, yet we continue to sin, there's got to be a reason. And the reason always is you don't study your Bible enough. You don't study your Bible enough. More Bible study, less sin. I mean, I mean, you 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 can tell me what you think about that. I know this, I can study my Bible 10 hours a day. I'm still never going to love God with all my heart, mind, body, and soul. I'm still going to lo- never love my neighbor and myself. I'm still not going to meet the command to be holy as God is holy. I'm still not going to meet the command to be perfect as my heavenly father is imperfect. So in other words, I can study my Bible 10 hours a day. And guess what? I'm still going to be in continual sin in those particular areas. I'm not, am I by any way downplaying the study of God's word? Obviously not. I have an entire podcast step, a series called Bible Study Exercise while all I'm doing is everything in my power to get Christians to actually study the Bible. And trust me, if there's anyone know, no, if there's anyone who knows how difficult it is to get people to actually study their Bibles, I can give you stories on how difficult it is to get Christians to do that. So I do believe we're supposed to study God's word. I just find it kind of like, it's kind of like, you know, hey, this is all that we have. You're still going to sin, but the the reason probably why is you're not studying the Bible yourself. How does the average Christian process that? Well, I keep sinning. I got to study my Bible more. I keep sinning. I got to study my Bible more. I keep sinning. I got to study my Bible more. I keep sinning. I got to study. Maybe I should just quit my job and just maybe get a room at a homeless shelter and just sit there all day studying my Bible because maybe I will stop sinning. Maybe I'll go join a monastery and just study my Bible all day. You know, you can't miss breakfast without starting to get hungry. You miss lunch, you're starting to feel weak. 
You miss lunch and supper and breakfast. You, you, you miss meals all day. And by the next day, you're probably even going to feel sick. Well, that is a physical illustration of a spiritual reality. You need the Word of God. Sometimes people come to me and they act like, you know, growing is this great mystery that no one can solve. How can we grow? And then I ask them this question. Well, how much time do you spend in the Word of God? And their answer is usually, it can't be that simple. Show me some trick or some key to spiritual growth. And I said, I'm trying to. You need to spend time in the Word of God. Now, look what he says again. Your word I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. Now, let's change it a little. Your word I have not treasured in my heart so that I might sin against you. Do you see? It works both ways. If you're going to neglect your study of Scripture, the memorization and meditation of Scripture, then you're opening your life to less and less conformity and to more and more sin. Now, when I talk about the Bible and studying the Bible, how should you do it? Well, I don't have the only way to do it, but let me tell you something that's very important. Most people jump back and forth. They read one portion in one book and then maybe another chapter in another book and they they go from here to there and they never really understand the counsel of God. They never really see the big picture. I would recommend that if you've never read the New Testament, start in the book of Matthew and read all the way through to the book of Revelation. And Okay, now he's going to tell you how to study the Bible because you'll fix it. But I'll just ask, I just think it's an interesting question. So if David says, if you hide your word, I've hid your word in my heart so I might not sin against thee, right? Yeah, he's making a claim. Let me just ask you a question. Was it a sin for David to have multiple wives? Was it a sin for David to basically practice polygamy? Now, if you say, yes, it was a sin, was he not hiding God's word in his heart? So how come hiding God's word in his heart did not stop his polygamy? Because if he had multiple wives, then that was a sin. And therefore, he was continually guilty of adultery, Versus the adultery he committed when he took another man's wife and had him killed. Okay, versus that. So, so exactly how do you work? So in other words, we could look at David's life and I think we would see a continual pattern of sin, an ongoing pattern of sin, which is called polygamy. Did he not know God's word? I mean, I don't know. He was used by God to write it as a polygamist. How about Solomon? He was used to write, you know, a proverb a day keeps the devil away. How many women did he have? Was that a sin? If you say it was a sin, they were continually in sin, yet they were being used to write scripture, meaning you think they would have some knowledge of it. So obviously the writing of it, knowing it, did not stop their sin. How do you process that into your formula? Do that several times and then go to the Old Testament Start in Genesis and read all the way through to Revelation and spend the rest of your life in that life discipline. Whether it's three, four, five, or 15 chapters a day, the important thing is that you're reading through the Bible systematically and you're beginning to see how all the pieces fit together. You're beginning to see the big picture of God and the big picture with regard to God's salvation and God's will. Very, very important. Now, I want us to go to the book of James for a moment. And I want to show you something that is often uh, overlooked, but it's been very helpful for me in my life. Uh, In chapter one, you know, James is 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 talking about trials. And then after he's talking about trials, James comes down and he says this. Verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. When I'm being tempted to do something, I need to realize, first of all, this is not from God, and this is not according to God's will, and this is not conformed to God's character. I need to see sin for what it really is, something that stands in opposition to everything that God is and everything that he desires.
Now, I'm in complete agreement. I want to make sure everybody understands because I think everyone's going to misinterpret everything I'm saying. I'm in complete agreement with what he says about confession. We need to confess. I'm in complete agreement that, yeah, we need to read and study God's word. I'm in complete agreement with that. Uh, I'm in complete agreement that we should strive against sin. All right. I'm in a complete agreement that we're going to continue to sin our entire Christian life. What I'm trying to point out is uh, on one hand, he's making certain claims. And if those claims are true, then this ongoing sin thing doesn't make any sense. And then he's saying that we sin less, but he hasn't quantified how we even understand that. And then what that always turns into, well, I stop these external things, but don't realize that those external things were caused by the deeper sin issue inside of us, which never goes away. So then how do I sin less if I'm sinning basically 24 hours a day, seven days a week? How do I even quantify that? There's been no discussion of that. So, and then it's like, well, it's your fault because you don't study the Bible. And so then how do you study it? Just read, I guess, from Matthew to Revelation, just there you go. That's, I don't know how that's actual study, but okay. But, but, um, there, there we, there, there we go. Now we're in James and when, now we need, and I do agree that when I'm being tempted, obviously I'm not being tempted of God. Now you, we could get into a whole struggle with, wait a minute, I'm not being tempted by God, but God is clearly allowing the temptation, which he could have stopped the temptation. So why didn't he stop the temptation? I mean, we could, we could have all kinds of struggles with that question. Okay. But all right, let's see. I still don't have a good answer about ongoing sin, but let's see if we're going to get it in the last few minutes. This is not just some little mistake. This is hostility. It's enmity. It's fighting against God and God's purposes in my life. And so I need to recognize sin for what it is. It's not coming from God. And when, when I'm, I'm living in this world and maybe uh, a person asks me to do something or there's a possibility to do something over here and I, I consider it in the light of Scripture and I realize it's not something God would want me to do, I need to recognize this is not from God. I am a child of God and I should have nothing to do with it. There is nothing. We have no fellowship, no, no truce, no unity with darkness with sin, with the devil. And so recognize when temptation comes, it's not from God and it needs to be rejected. Now, verse 14, it says, but each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Now, please note, where does it start? With our own lust, internally. Even if I stop the external action, the internal lust, there's a high probability is still there because inside of me is a sinful nature that continually lust for itself. Now, he hasn't, he hasn't dealt with the a reality of the sinful nature. He claimed we have a new heart, but he didn't say what happens to the sinful nature. What happened? So the old heart is removed. The new heart is there. Therefore, there is no internal lust. But James seems to clearly indicate why do we sin? Because of the internal lust. So the sin inside of us obviously still remains. So even if I stop the external, the internal sin is still there. The internal lust and desire and sinful nature is still there. So how do we understand that in light of the concept of ongoing sin? When a temptation comes and it enters into your mind, do this or look here, that's not sin. That's a temptation. That's not sin. It becomes sin when you give in to it. When you give yourself over to it, when you devote yourself to it, when you deliver yourself to do that very thing, that's when it becomes sin. Just remember, though, according to Jesus, if I look at a woman with lust, I've already committed adultery before I ever give myself over to doing it. I don't have to give myself to do it. I just have to let myself think it, desire it, want it. Is that not true or am I missing something? But when it first enters into your mind, look at that. No, that's not temptation. But here's what you need to understand. You can't play around with temptation. You can't play around with sin. It will grab you and it will grab you quickly. If you're out working in the fields in India or Pakistan and there is a big cobra and you've got a machete in your hand and all of a sudden that cobra rises up, you, you, don't have, you can't sit there and, and talk to it. You can't reason with it. 
is going to strike in a matter of a second or two. You've got to take off its head or you've got to flee. You've got to get out of there. You can't play around with it. How many children do we know, at least in, in around, that have been around me in my lifetime, that have sat there and played around with poisonous snakes, having a good time, and then all of a sudden they get too close, they get too careless, and what happens? The snake strikes. When you see the temptation, when it appears, don't play with it. Don't meditate on it. Don't think about it. Kill it. Get away from it. Flee from it. Now, I'm not disagreeing with what he's saying, but there is another element to this. The temptation comes from external, but the lust is internal. So even if I cut that off, the internal desire is still inside of me. That sinful desires desires are still inside of me. We always seem to try to make this like such an external. Keep the external thing away from you and you're good to go. You Even if the external thing never gets near me, I got enough internal stuff inside of me that I still may become guilty of the external act just because Jesus seems to say that the internal desire and thought may be sufficient enough to condemn you and make you a sinner. So how do we reconcile that with this concept? I think the reason the external temptation has any power is because of the internal sinful nature that welcomes it and desires it. If if there's no internal sinful nature, the external temptation has very, has little power if there's not something inside. We're told to flee from certain sins. You see? Do you remember when when Cain was angry? He was very, very angry. And God said to him, sin is waiting at the door and its desire is to have you. You need to realize something. Sin is like a wild animal. And when it approaches... It wants you. It wants to devour you. It wants to destroy you. The Bible says the devil is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So don't play with this. Cut it off immediately. And here's another thing that's very important about sin. Don't go to places where sin is easy. You know, sometimes I've had to deal with men who have been uh, converted out of alcoholism. And they say, what are some of the things I should do? I said, don't go back to the places where you used to frequent. Don't run with the same guys and don't go near those taverns and places where you used to drink. Physically stay away from them. This is very important. You know why you have to physically stay away from them? Because the internal desire is still there. Well, how can the internal desire still be there when you said you get a brand new heart and you now have the Holy Spirit inside of you? Why aren't all those internal desires done away with and are gone? Christians seem to say two separate things. You you have a brand new heart. You've got the Holy Spirit. You've been transformed. Yeah. But, 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 but don't go over there because, man, you, that, that temptation is going to be too strong. Wait, why would that temptation be strong if I'm all transformed on the inside? Because you're not transformed on the inside. The old is still there. So how do we, like, if you're going to talk about ongoing sin, you got to talk about the reality of what's still on the inside, which is a sinful nature filled with lust and desire, with a desire to exalt self, please self, serve self, worship self, because self is the God that we all have a problem fighting against. So you can't, on one hand, say you've got a brand new heart and then never acknowledge well, what, what's still inside of me. The issue is what's inside of me. If the inside is completely changed, then I could go anywhere because that temptation would only have an external impact on me. But if there's nothing inside of me to want it, desire it, okay, so even if I remove all of the externals, I'm still going to find myself in sin somehow internally, some way, shape, or form, unless we misunderstand Jesus' concepts that, hey, you can literally be guilty of murder on the inside. You can literally be guilty of adultery on the inside. Ever, before you ever even come close to doing anything externally. 
putting us in a position where we're always going to be in sin, meaning the only hope of our salvation is an imputed righteousness. By, uh, by no means is it a practical righteousness. We have to at least acknowledge these other concepts that we're going to talk about ongoing sin. On the internet and other things, never put yourself in a position where you can be alone with temptation. Build guards around you to protect yourself. You've got to realize how weak you are and how strong the devil is and how strong. Okay, see, you got to know how weak you really are. So a new heart, uh, a, a, re, a transformed, regenerated life and the Holy Spirit in you doesn't give you that much strength because you're so weak that you've got to do this, 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 and 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 this. Do you not see, like, it's almost like Christians are schizophrenic. On one hand, you've got power. You've been transformed. You, and on the other hand, you are so weak. You better not even be alone with anything. Don't go anywhere. Don't look at anything. Hide in the closet. Pluck your eyes out. Chop off your hands. And move into a monastery. Sin and its lust can be. Now, it says in verse 15, Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Another thing that you need to realize about sin, it's deadly. You say, well, I'm a Christian. Okay, you're a Christian. It's still deadly. How many Christian homes have I seen destroyed by sin? How many Christian ministries are no more because of sin. How many men who have been used mightily of God to do great things and then they fall into sin and it, un- it undoes everything? See, that's the thing. Why is there so much sin all around you? See, you're acknowledging the presence of ongoing sin. Ongoing sin. It's here. It's here. It's here. It's here. It's here. It's, it destroys this. It destroys this. Well, if, if sin is ongoing, then why are we shocked that any of those things happen? It's like we don't, on one hand, we try to act like we shouldn't sin because we have all this power. Then on the other hand, we acknowledge how weak we are. We acknowledge that it's everywhere and people are falling and people are falling and people are falling and people are falling. I will say that if those external things were never seen or heard that caused the supposed scandal, the sin was already inside. It was already present. And we don't ever want to acknowledge that we're, uh, we're living in ongoing sin internally 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Now, now I know what you're saying. So you're just saying it doesn't matter? No, I'm saying we need a new approach that says, look, everyone here. Like, I'm I'm saying I'm sitting in a room with 50 people. We're all messed up. Everyone in this room is a sinner. You sin in some way, shape, or form, internally or externally. So when that sin manifests itself, okay, we have to deal with it. Hopefully, you will confess and, and seek to turn from it. We are here to help you, but it can't be just, just like we, it's it just this weird thing. Like you can't sin because if you do, you're destroyed. How about like you sinned? Now we got to seek to restore you. And, and yeah, maybe you have to step down and maybe we have to do this. I'm not talking a legal activity because obviously you got legal consequences, but there's got to be a way where it, we, that it's almost like Christianity doesn't want to deal with the reality that everyone is messed up and sin is just as, as common within the Christian world as breathing is. That was good before. Sin is deadly. It's monstrous. You need to fear it. You need to run from it. Now, Verse 16, this is the important part in dealing with temptation. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good thing given, every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shifting shadow. Now, what else should you recognize? When temptation comes, do not be deceived about the goodness of God. You see, in the garden, that's one of the first things that the devil did. When the devil was tempting Eve, he tried to make her believe that God wasn't good, that God had prohibited her from eating from all the trees of the garden. That wasn't true. And so the devil will basically always get you to think, well, God's not going to help you here. God's not going to meet this need. 
And so you need to succumb to this temptation. I'm offering you something because God won't offer you anything. And you need to realize when temptation comes, I'm not going to grab a hold of it. Why? Because God is good and he's got something better for me. Especially I tell this to young men who are who are not married. I say, you know, you have these temptations, and these opportunities to commit immoralities and fornications and other things. And they're very, very strong. To, to look at things on the internet, very, very strong and very, very evil and very, very damaging to the soul. But when those temptations appear, what should you do? Recognize that God is good, that He has a plan. He has a plan even to fulfill those physical desires you have. He has a righteous plan and the devil is offering you a counterfeit plan. Are you sure God has a plan to meet those physical needs? Are you sure that those physical needs are always going to be met? Uh, is that, is like, hey, just hold out and God's going to make sure all your physical needs are met. Are you sure that that's the way it's going to work? What if God doesn't meet those physical needs? When you see that counterfeit plan, you need to reject it because it is not the best thing for your life. It is not a good thing for your life. You need to wait because God has promised to give you good. That's where I find some of my greatest strength against sin is recognizing the goodness and the kindness of God that whatever temptation comes, it is a counterfeit. I hate to be the one to ask the question, but I think any like person who thinks this through, like Christians are afraid sometimes of the tough questions, but I'm not afraid of the tough questions, right? Because we have to do ask ourselves a very important question here. When it comes with ongoing sin and it comes with temptation, there is something we have to at least ask ourselves, especially in relation to the goodness of God. God is all knowing. He's omnipresent and he is all powerful. He is indwelling us in the person of the Holy Spirit. One, why then are we not sin, sinless? Right? Why, why does he just then not completely eradicate the old nature? We have no desire for the old nature and we just stop sinning. Clearly, he doesn't. The old nature is still there. We still sin. So why, why not just remove it all? He does not. Number two, God is all-knowing, omnipresent, and all-powerful. Why does he not keep temptation from us? He obviously could, but he clearly doesn't. You, you have to at least consider that in the grand scheme of things. Right? Okay, hey, you're all sinners. You all have a sinful nature. Now, he saves us because of an imputed righteousness, not an infused righteousness, right? He gives us commands that clearly we cannot keep and we are condemned. So, but then at the same time, once we're saved, he doesn't step in to just make sin go away. He doesn't eradicate the old nature. He doesn't stop it. I mean, he's present everywhere at all times. He, he's got the Holy Spirit inside of me. Uh, clearly that could give me the power to stop sinning, but he doesn't. So then how do we understand, how do we reconcile that reality with those truths about God? I think any good Christian should be struggling with that question. You say, well, what's the answer? I don't have a good answer, but I mean, you can't just pretend that that's not the case. Here's the all-powerful, all all-knowing God who is present everywhere at all time. And yet here we are. Hey, you're going to be tempted. 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 Well, God is good. Well, couldn't God then just stop the temptation? Couldn't God just give me the strength? Couldn't God just eradicate the nature? of the goodness of God. It's like a beautiful apple maybe on the outside, but it's full of poison on the inside. But everything God gives is good on the outside and the inside. It is good through and through. So those are some of the ways in which we deal with temptation. But, but come on now. Use some wisdom here. If you're awake 16 hours a day, You're in this world behind enemy lines 16 hours a day. Do you see that? You're hearing the world 
You're being influenced by the world. If you do not spend time in the Word of God, copious amounts of time, if you do not spend time in prayer, if you do not spend time in the good fellowship of a sound church with other believers, you're not going to be able to overcome. And don't go out there looking for some TV evangelist to touch your life and give you power. Don't look for some silly gimmick that's not going to help you with sin. What do you need? You need to study the Word of God. You need to pray for strength. You need to be in the fellowship of a very strong local church under elders that care about your soul and under elders that are preaching the exposition of God's Word. That's what you need. All right. Well, God bless you. Because Christians who do those things never sin. See, the, all, of the, all of the threat he placed externally. See, the threat. See, you're behind enemy lines. It's the, the world. No, the problem is inside of us. That's the problem. It's internal. The, the source of ongoing sin is not the world. It's inside of you. It's inside of me. And even if I see some of the external acts, the internal desire, flesh, and lust is still very much present. That's why we have to be saved by an imputed righteousness. Because sin is going to be ongoing in our life. I'm not saying we should excuse it. We have to constantly fight against it, but we got to realize first and foremost, the problem is inside of us. There's the problem. We have to start where the problem it's, you know, it's not that I live behind enemy lines. The enemy lives inside of me. I'm the enemy. We always like the world is the enemy. I'm not denying that the world is not there. I'm not saying that the world, the flesh and the devil is not a problem, but the world, the flesh and the devil is a problem because I desire the world, flesh and the devil because I have the sinful net. Well, the flesh is us, obviously, but it's because of my sinful nature. The problem is inside of us. And God chose not to remove it. not excusing anything, trying to talk about this in a very real way to avoid the weird schizophrenic contradiction and logical fallacies in our discussions about it, which is always so weird to me. Hey, you've got all of this power, but you can't stop sinning. But you could stop sinning if you studied your Bible more. But even if you studied your Bible, you're going to say, like, could you someone just explain to me how this works? But I can't because we're out of time. So I'm going to stop right there. At least we threw the concept out there because it's so, it's maddening to hear so many, the thoughts of so many Christians on the subject. Like 2,000 years of church history, and guess what we've seen? Sin, 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 Moral failure, moral failure, sin, 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 Division, fighting, arguing, gossip, slander, backbiting, broken marriages, sin, 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 adultery, fornication, well, or biblical history, of you know, polygamy, all over the place. I mean, you got you got sin all over the place, even in the people of God. Sin, 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 sin. Sin, 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 sin. You can't get mad at me with pointing out the reality of it. And if you're even five seconds honest with your own self, you know how much sin is inside of you. I don't care how much you dress it up. You can dress it up in a three-piece suit, say all the right words, say amen when you're supposed to say amen, hallelujah when you're supposed to say hallelujah, put the right amount of money in the offering plate, sing the hymn, read the Bible. You can do it all. But you know, if you're even halfway honest with yourself, how far you fall short on a regular basis in thought, word, and deed, and by what you do and leave undone. And the same is true of me. That's why I praise God. My only hope is an imputed righteousness. That's my only hope. But there you go. You can contact me, newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. Sure, this will spark some strong opinions. We will see. All right, thanks for listening. God bless.